in the Bible. Okay, Jesus has been, he rode in on the donkey, so we've had the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday. He's been teaching in the temple now, and it's pretty much to the end of it. Now, tonight, what we're reading about is tonight is the Lord's Supper. So, reading about that and uh, all that goes along with that. Luke, in his investigation, gave some interesting perspectives. So a few key things are in Luke that aren't in other Gospels. So we're going to make sure we highlight and emphasize those so we can get all that we can out of, the, out of these Gospel teachings. Um, so having said all that, let's go ahead and ask the Lord's blessing and then dive in. Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for this time. We thank you that you are our God and that we uh, have chosen to yield ourselves before you and to listen to you, Father. And we anxiously await for you to take us home to be with you, Jesus. In the meantime, would you open our ears and our eyes and, and send your Holy Spirit to help us see and hear what we need today from you, Lord, and to apply it to our lives and, and become a little bit more like you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. So chapter 22, let's go ahead and read verses 1 through 6. Luke writes, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. So he went his way and conferred with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he promised and sought opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of the multitude. So again, my notes, I kind of review again. So this is that week between Palm Sunday and Easter, you know, uh, the week of Passover and unleavened bread and first fruits. That's the holidays going on. Um, and I want to show something to the people out there, kind of like the, the outline I'm going to be going on. And I'm not sure how well you're going to be able to see this. Um, I'm only, I, I planned only to show this once. Um, so you might need to uh, freeze it or look at it, however you want to look at it. But I'm going to show this, this chart that we're going to be referring to. This is, this is what I'm going to be teaching from uh, when discussing the time frame. As you can see, the date up here, uh, April, which is the Hebrew month of Nisan. And... Uh, this is how many days he was dead, like night one, day one, and all that. I put that across the top. Um, the holiday that was mentioned here, uh, that Monday, what was going on, and the, the scripture verse. The Tuesday, which is the first non-obligatory Passover, we'll discuss that. We'll discuss Passover, um, the Sabbath that came after it, this, which is special, because it was the Feast of uh, First Fruits. Oh, no, I'm sorry, the first day of Unleavened Bread. Um, then that Friday, that Saturday, and that Sunday... And you can see the verses. I'm going to go back over a little slower without my hand. I'm trying to hold it still. Breathe. So you can see the verses um, for each day and what was going on. Um, but this is, this is as best as I could put these verses together from both the Old Testament and the New Testament of, and the calendar, the year, and the days um, what was happening uh, during that week, so you can get a good perspective. Um, this is that holy week, and uh, I just wanted to show that chart for reference. So right now on that chart, um, this is the evening, that Tuesday evening, um, when actually probably Tuesday afternoon when Judas goes out, maybe Monday, and tries to... Uh, tries to uh, set up a plan uh, to go ahead and have Jesus arrested um, and brought to them secretly. So, what are the leader's motives? The leadership, what are they doing? Their motives. You could see it right there in verse 2. They sought how they might kill him. We need to keep that in mind because that's critical later on in the study. Their motive is to kill Jesus, bottom line. They're not going there to try and compromise with them, try and get him to join their group or them join his group or, or settle them down or anything. That's not an option. Life is not an option. It's death. 
They want to kill him. Um, we know that Judas was one of the twelve. So why the emphasis? Isn't that interesting? This whole time, we, we, we've known who the disciples were. It's pretty common knowledge. But you hear this emphasis. Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. That's like, for some reason, it's, it's, it's known, you know. Uh, so why the emphasis? And I have in my notes here, 1 Corinthians 10, 12, to read this. Um, it, you would think, you think about that, the disciples, they're there with Jesus for three and a half years. Okay. Luke, I think, is saying here, he's without excuse. He was one of the twelve. This is unreasonable. This is wrong. Why is Satan entering his heart and motivating him, possessing him and leading him to do this dastardly deed? 1 Corinthians 10.12 says, therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. And the caution is, don't ever think you're so close to Christ that you're untouchable. Okay? Because the moment we get that pride, that's when the enemy puts his foot out and trips us up. Yes? With, with Judas? With, with the Jewish, with, with Rome. Right, no, he wasn't there to start a war at all. Right. With, with Rome. With, that's was what Judas was thinking. I, I think Judas, his motive, well, there's a lot of speculation, I tried to stay away from that. They thought he was trying to push Jesus into stepping up and being the Messiah to rescue them from Rome. Is, is, so, to your point, um, but I, his true motive is not in Scripture, and so I kind of tried to, tell Ms. Rosa, I tried to stay away from speculating too much. Um, I get myself in trouble when I do that, <laughs> when I speculate. Um, the... So the point I put in my notes is, let's not criticize Judas, but learn from him. What can we learn from this man who sold out Christ? What we can learn is we need to keep ourselves always humble. And don't ever think that, hey, just because I just spent the last three years with Christ, he even anointed me and sent me out preaching twice, going out healing the sick and raising dead and casting out spirits, I'm untouchable. Never. Some, if, if you think you are, like I said, the pride goes before a fall, and haughty spirit, or pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Um, gotta be careful. Always stay humble before your Lord. Never think, well, gee, um, I speak Hebrew and Greek. I read the originals. In fact, I've read the Bible a thousand times. Um, I, I have a double doctorate in quantum physics, and I'm untouchable. Whatever. No. <laughs> It doesn't matter. Even Judas, one of the twelve. In fact, even Peter, one of the twelve. In fact, all of the twelve abandoned Christ. None of them stuck with him when he was on the cross. None of them were there hanging with him. He was by himself. Where were the other twelve? You see, it, it's a, it, we've got to learn from the, the, the example of these men. Don't criticize them. And ex all we can say is, there, but by the grace of God, go I. I can just as easily abandon him. If he asks me to watch and pray for an hour, I could just as easily fall asleep like they did. I'm nobody special. That's the attitude. Stay humble. Lord, I'm as weak as anybody else. If it's not you keeping me strong, Lord, I will fall too. 
So the angel of light, the angel of light's job is to fool you into thinking you were doing right and then condemn you when you do what you did. <laughs> That's what he does. He gets you thinking, man, I got to force Christ's hand. And then all of a sudden you realize, I blew it. And the devil's right there to say, oh yeah, you blew it big time. Every time we do that, we fall for his tricks. He's right there with condemnation. Yeah, <laughs> sucker. <laughs> got you again. Verse 7 through 13. So let's, let's thank God that uh, we have these examples to learn from and not criticize any of these guys. Uh, Luke writes in verse 7, Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat. What were they going to go do? Eat the Passover that night. So as, as we do this, we need to step carefully. That night, the next day, we know was called the day of preparation for what? The Passover. Wait a second, didn't they just eat it the night before? Yes, there was two, and we'll explain all about that. There was two nights of it, and it's very critical that, that there are, because then the Lord could establish and do what he needed to do on the first one and still die when they were sacrificing the Passover lamb the next day. Isn't that phenomenal? How just the Lord sets these details up. Anyway, where did they leave off? Verse 9. So they said to him, Where do you want us to prepare? And he said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. Then you shall say to the master of the house, The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large room, furnished, a large, a large furnished upper room. There make ready. So they went and found it just as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. This is kind of weird. Doesn't it sound like a James Bond type 007 scenario? <laughs> when you go in the city, you're going to find this. Go down the street, do this. Like, why the mystery? Why the elusiveness? What did we just read about? Judas was looking for an opportunity to have him captured, arrested. Jesus didn't want that to happen yet. So he had this arrangement made so Judas would know nothing about what was going to happen. Judas was kept in the dark. That's why this whole elusive plan, go down this street. You'll see this man carrying, carrying a jar. Men don't carry jars of water. What's up with that? That's the whole thing. The secrecy, the clandestine plan so the Lord could have his night in peace with the disciples. From my notes, goodness gracious, what did I write? Okay. We got some good stuff coming up here. Fasten your seatbelts. Uh, I got this off of the internet, and you know the internet does not lie. It's 100% true. Everything on it. This is from https colon slash slash en dot wikibooks dot org slash wiki slash Hebrew underscore root slash holy slash uh, underscore days slash Passover slash history. Procured yesterday. It says, Keeping the original Passover tradition, Yeshua, who is Jesus, instructed Peter and John a full 24 hours before the Passover of the Jews to make preparations to eat a Seder-type supper that very evening. According to an early manuscript of Matthew's Gospel, he had explained to them the reason for this observance. This was the 14th of Nisan, the evening before his execution. He became the Passover lamb later, on, on that day, which was the next day, at approximately 3 p.m., when the Passover lambs were being slain in the temple. Uh, they think that ex the exact time, that time, because it was six hours he was on the cross, he was put on a nine, died at three, the exact time he cried out, it is finished, is when they were killing the Passover lambs for Passover, the exact time. When the Passover lambs were being slain in the temple for the main observance of the Passover the following evening. In the system of the day, there was a provision for Yeshua to be able to do this. Although the Passover lambs were not sacrificed until the following day, it was common to have a Seder the night before as a preparatory meal or a hakiga, I had to practice that, which was an extra non obligatory 
sacrificial offering for the feast. So know that what they're saying is there was a, a special one in preparation for the main Passover. They often ate one the night before. Now listen to why. Rabbis at the time often had a special meal with their disciples the night before the traditional Passover to celebrate and finish a course of scripture study or just as a night of instruction and preparation uh, for their form of Passover as they kept it on the following day, the 15th. To this day, rabbis in the Lubavic tradition still have this preparatory meal called the Messiah's Supper in anticipation of the coming of the Messiah. Some consider and call it a Passover even though it's just a preparation. So, so they still celebrate this over in Israel, not for Jesus' sake, but looking forward to the coming of the Messiah, which they believe he's still on his way, but we know he already came. Last paragraph, Yahweh provided a means whereby his son could keep the right Torah observance and introduce a new covenant as well as fulfill the typology of the Passover lamb slain for the sins of the people. He fulfilled this perfectly by dying at the same time as the sacrificial lambs were slain, and then three days and nights later he arose at the time of the first fruits being taken from the earth and ascended the next morning with his blood to the Father, to the Father as the wave offering, the wave sheaf offering, was presented in the temple. So as the wave offering was being presented in the temple, Jesus was presenting his blood before the Father as our offering. So yeah, this kind of all matches up why the Old Testament was given as an example of, of why, we, why we do things the way we do them and, and what's going on. Um, so that's what was happening. So the, the non-obligatory one was the night before. This is the one Jesus was celebrating with his disciples. And he could take it then and bring out its truer meaning, which we celebrate today in the communion. Um, the next day was the main Passover on the 15th, which if you look at the chart, that's out of Leviticus 22.15, Leviticus 23.5, Leviticus 23.6. Um, you can read about the Passover and the, and the dates and when they celebrated it. Um, so let me read what else I wrote in my notes. The rest of this uncommon man-carrying water... Um, was so as to throw off Judas as Jesus wanted to be undisturbed for this night so he could do what he did. Um, and that's why we have that special non-obligatory Passover the night before. Why Jesus did what he did. So that explains how he could eat and how they could also have the Passover the next night. Verse 14 through 23. Verse 14 starts off. Luke says, when the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the, first, of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God, has, God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And truly, the Son of Man goes as it has been determined... But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to question among themselves which of them it was who would do this thing. Who would betray Christ? Isn't that fascinating? How on this night he says, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this. You know, traditionally in the Passover, the youngest who could speak would ask questions. There were several questions doing it during a traditional Passover that they asked. The youngest child would ask, what makes this night different from all the rest? And so they might ask, well, 
why makes you know why why this Passover with fervent desire, you know. So why why is this one different, Lord? So why did Jesus say verse fifteen, with fervent desire? Why this one? I think it was because he was about to take two of the elements of the Passover. There's about ten different elements in the whole process. He was taking two of the ten, boiling it down to two, and magnifying them and explaining them a more clear meaning of what what the symbology, why why these things are here, and providing it providing us a reminder that we can celebrate the communion with, lest we grow complacent in our Christianity and actually forget the broken body and the blood of Christ in our walk with Christ, grow complacent and forget about Him. So, but what does it all mean? The fourth cup was the cup of marriage and celebration. Okay. And in verse 16 it says, For I, I will no longer eat of it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom. I'm not going to do this again until it's fulfilled and finished and completed in the kingdom. So we have that, uh, that cup of marriage which won't take place until the marriage supper of the Lamb. Um, in Exodus, if you want to go and learn a little bit about the, the, the whole process, there's four cups in the communion. I'm not the communion. Four cups in the Passover. And they come out of Exodus 6, verses 6 and 7, where God says, Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. And listen, this is the fourth cup right here out of verse 7. It says, I will take you as my people. Do you kind of hear a wedding vow-ish phraseology in there? Do you take so-and-so? Do you take so-and-so to be you? Where God says, I will take you. Okay, that's why the fourth cup, the last cup in the uh, Passover is called the cup of marriage or celebration. And that's why Jesus said, I can't drink of it now, but I will when it's fulfilled. And one day, friends, we're going to be there with, with him in the kingdom celebrating that. The first cup is called the cup of consecration. When he says, I will bring you out. In verse 6, therefore, say to the children of Israel, I'm the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. He consecrates us, which means to bring us out from an ordinary setting and to make something sacred. It's to set something apart as holy, as sacred. Consecration. We are to be consecrated to the Lord. The second cup was the cup of deliverance. I will rescue you from their bondage, okay, which he has done for us. Okay, Incidentally, I believe that was the cup that he was holding when he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. Because between the second and third cup is when they broke that bread. Um, and that bread has another interesting meaning. But the third cup is the cup of redemption. And this is when it says, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. And this is another cup that I believe, the cup after the bread, after supper, when they also took. And he said, this is the cup, the cup of redemption. That is a cup of, of my blood, of the new covenant. Isn't that just interesting? With the meaning behind all this? That's the cup we drink from in communion. The last one, of course, we talked about. Uh, the marriage cup. I will take you as my people. Um, but between the second and third cup, we have verse 19. which says, And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. What we have here is, during the Passover, they take three pieces of matzah. It's a square piece of bread that is baked rapidly. Okay? And what happens at high heat is it, it has stripes on it then. The way they bake it. And they also puncture it with holes so it bakes faster at this high heat. It bakes through thoroughly. Bakes fast, high heat, and it has holes and stripes on it. Interesting, huh? Stripes and 
poles. And Jesus is this bread. Well, they take these three pieces of matzah and they put in, in what's called a matzah tash. It's a three-layered bag called a bread bag, matzah tash. Put it one in the top, one in the middle, one at the bottom. Then they take out the middle one. The rabbi or the head of the household breaks it, puts half back in the matzah tash, and the other half, it's called the afikoman, he wraps in a linen cloth and then hides it. Is there any other bread that we know of that is half God, half man, or the combination combined, not necessarily half and half, but all God, all man in one, broken, pierced, striped, wrapped in linen, hidden, and then they feast after the, the father hides it in the house. It's a game. They eat and eat and eat and eat between the second and third cup. Then, after they're done eating, the kids play a game. They try and go out and find that afikoman, and they bring it back. Hidden away, and then it's brought back, as in resurrection. Okay? That's the bread I believe Jesus took and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. But I can't eat it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom. So take it and divide it among yourselves when it's all put back together as one in the kingdom. Then we will feast with our Lord and Savior. I'm so excited. Looking forward to that. Anyway, um, verse 20 is that third cup of redemption. We read about that. Likewise, it's the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which we read about from Exodus, when he says, I will redeem you. The cup of redemption. Verse 22 says, And truly the Son of Man goes as it had been determined, but woe to that man by whom he was betrayed. It was determined in the model of the Lamb, silent before its shears, and all the rest of Isaiah 53, we've known it, we've read it dozens of times, you don't need to necessarily go hammer through it again about the suffering Messiah. Psalm 22, we've read that. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I'm surrounded by the bulls of Bashan, I'm surrounded by dogs. As he's hanging up there, they pierced my hands and feet, I can count all my bones. We've read about that. And in Genesis 3, when God curses the devil and, uh, concerning the woman's seed, you know, he's going to bust your head. You might bruise his heel, but he's going to thump you good. <laughs> We're going to read that later on. But then, but Jesus says, woe to Judas. Woe to Judas. Because by his own free will, he chose his eternity. And as much as Jesus wanted to save him, as much as his death on the cross was for Judas, and he would have done it if Judas was the only man on earth, and that was it. He would have went through all of this to save him. His heart went out to Judas. Whoa. Those, the weeping and the sweating great drops of blood in the garden was also for Judas because he met him one last time in the garden. It's Judas. Basically, he was saying, don't do this. Don't do this. You're betraying me with the kiss? Really? Wow. But he, God's a gentleman, and he will not impose himself on you. He will not force you to go to heaven. You have to choose to go yourself. If you don't want to go, he won't force you. Nobody's going to be in heaven that doesn't want to be there. Most people in hell, in fact, everybody in hell just can't stand God. That's why they choose. I really just can't stand him. Don't want to be there. We go on. Verse 24 through 30. Am I uh, making good? I make sure I don't go screamingly long like, like I did last time. Um, verse 24 through 30. 24 says, Now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. And he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles exercised lordship over them. And those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. Benefactors. Yeah, those are the guys in Washington, D.C. who take $100 from you and give back one and say, we are your benefactors. 
Verse 26, I digress. But not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as the one who serves. And I believe it was at that time that he was washing their feet. But are you... But you are those who have continued with me in my trials, and I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my Father bestowed one upon me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So we don't have that in the other Gospels, but we have it here, a unique little phrase there. And you wonder, here he is hours from his crucifixion and death, and they're still arguing among themselves who's going to be the greatest. Yeah, you, you kind of wonder. But again, you can't be too tough on these guys. You have to say, there but by the grace of God go I, and I could do just the same thing. At one of the most critical times in the Lord's ministry, I could be watching Saturday Night Live and, and doing something totally stupid. So... Again, I can't hold these things against these guys. I just have to learn from what's going on here. <coughs> learn from it. How often do we get our eyes up what it really means to be a Christian and instead get caught up in petty and trivial matters? They were becoming what Jesus talked about earlier, seed type three. Remember the third one was uh, planted among the thorns and the thorns rose up around it and choked it and it became unfruitful. And the thorns were the cares of this world. Another scripture calls those thorns the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and pride of life. Those things that choke the cares and riches of this world. Jesus' example is what they should have been following, what we need to follow. What's that example that he's setting before us? The example of Jesus is do whatever it takes to serve and obey God. <clears throat> excuse me, doing his will and following his call for you. Do whatever it takes. Have that reckless faith like Paul had. It didn't matter. See, Paul was a, is a unique individual in his salvation. He was a hard, hardcore individual. When he set out to do something, man, you could not stop him. And the Lord said, that's what I need of my disciples. I need that hardcore attitude that once they get started on something, they're not going to stop. So the Lord sought out to rescue Saul and met him on the road and, and converted him. And he knew, now I got him. And he showed him and said, but wait, before you make this decision, I want to show you what you're going to suffer if you choose to follow me. And so it says that the Lord showed him what things he must suffer. And Saul said, yeah, I'm all in. Let's do this. In other words, Paul Saul, who became Paul, was shown what he was going to go through and still said, I am all in. Shipwrecks, beatings, stonings, hunger, nakedness, rejection, I'm all in. Count me in. He had this faith that was what I call reckless faith. He didn't care. Throw me out of the synagogue. Stone me. I'm just going to get back up and come back in and tell you more. Tell you about the vision I saw while I was out cold. And, and that's the example Jesus is giving us to follow. Do whatever it takes. You might be hung on a cross. You might be rejected by those who call themselves religious leadership. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I got you. That was the first part. Do whatever it takes to serve and obey God and follow His calling on your life. And serve others until it kills you. Not caring a bit about the things of this world, but depending wholly upon God, even as He cares for you, even as He cares for the sparrows. Don't worry about the things of this world. Be like Paul. Be like Christ. Have that reckless faith that desires one thing, God's approval and the salvation of others. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Do I got to get dirty and get in the mud? I'm going to get dirty in the mud. Shipwreck, beatings, I don't care. Someone's going to get saved. And to him who overcomes will be rewarded in heaven. Won't they? 
We are making good time. Um, verse 31 through 34. Peter's denial. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny three times that you know me. We all fail at times, but what sets us apart is what set Peter apart from Judas. What set David apart from Saul. David would, was said to be a man after God's own heart, right? Peter and David, when they made mistakes, they ran back to God in repentance. King Saul and Judas ran from God. So when Peter realized his denial, he wept bitterly. And we'll read about that. But that's the difference. Are you, when you realize you've made a mistake, do you be like Adam and try and run and cover yourself up with the most itchy, uncomfortable leaf in the whole garden? The fig leaf? <laughs> really? That did a lot of good. Or do you run to God? Say, Lord, I oopsed. You know, when I was raising uh, my three boys, I told them, I, I got this way of disciplining you for when you step out of line. One, if you come up to me and say, yeah, I screwed up, your punishment's going to be very light. But if you try and lie, the punishment for lying will be way worse than the punishment for what you did wrong. So I encourage you, just admit it. Say, hey, I oopsed. And many times, like when they broke a glass or did something that was just a boy being a boy, I did nothing at all. They're just, hey, they're just kids. They're just a boy being a boy. What can you say? <laughs> what can you do? Um, kids will be kids. But if they lie about it and run from the truth and try and cover it up, that's when there was some discipline to pay. So I encourage us, be like Peter, be like David, run to the Lord, run back. Admit it, I screwed up, Lord. I don't want to run from you because I value my relationship with you. And I know you don't want me to run from you. Or else you would not have sent Jesus to die for me. Verse 35. And he said to them, When I sent you without money, bag, and knapsack, and sandals, did you lack anything? So they said nothing. Then he said to them, But now he who has a money bag, let him take it, and likewise a knapsack. And he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say to you, that this which is written must still be accomplished in me. Quote, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Unquote. For the things concerning me have an end. So they said, Lord, look, here we have two swords. And he said to them, it's enough. A lot of different commentaries on this. Um, people were saying, oh, this refers to the sword as being the word of God, not to a literal sword. Well, then why did Peter have a sword and cut off the person's ear in the garden? If it wasn't a literal sword they are talking about. So how do we unpack this verse about swords? About weapons? Very carefully. On November 5th, 2017, Devin Kelly killed 26 people and wounded 20 more others in the First Baptist Church in Sutherland Springs, Texas, firing approximately 700 rounds. He was stopped by Stephen Williford, a neighbor of the church who shot Kelly twice. The Lord said, if you don't have one, get one. Two out of three of my boys have guns. I'm proud of it. <laughs> Go on, you know. I'm not advocating faith in guns to save us. We have faith in the Lord. No, I'm not advocating gun violence by any means. But doggone it, if a man walks into a church, a movie theater, a school, 
with a gun and intends to do harm, that needs to be stopped. Amen. That is what I believe the Lord is talking about, not persecution. We are not to flee and, and, and shy away from and defend ourselves against persecution. That's up to the church to suffer. And, and there's a difference. There's a difference between what's talked about here and, and persecution. And that's the tricky boundary and tightrope I intended to walk. How do you distinguish the two? Mm -hmm. There are bad people in there out there who intend to do violence just for violence's sake. Like I said, going into schools, movie theaters, churches, etc. Shooting up concerts like in Las Vegas. Um, going into bars like in Florida. Just people doing stupid things that we need to defend ourselves from. And that, I believe, is okay. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Oh. Yes, that time, that was a wrong use. That's a good point. Um, so he doesn't want us to be violent. Well, we, he, he knows what's bad. True. For the, 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 the distinction I'm trying to make is for persecution, you're absolutely right. If the government says, I'm coming around to collect all your Bibles and throw all Christians in jail, Christians don't return the other cheek, and that's the time. We don't fight back. We endure the persecution the Lord has for us. But there's bad guys out there who, if like they, just a bad guy, this is not the government, just like a stupid idiot out there, um, or even in our home, if they come to rob us, we have the right to defend ourselves. And for example, if somebody were to come in here and I was armed, I would do my best to take out that person to protect us because that is a bad guy. He's not seeking to persecute us. He's just a bad, stupid guy intending to kill. That's, that's the difference. I believe that's what the Lord's talking about. And look at the ratio. Two swords, 12 guys. He's not saying, let's go overboard with this and get like machine guns and, and tanks and stuff. A church doesn't need to be armed like a military. But how many churches these days do have members who conceal carry among the congregations for that purpose. Okay? It's, it's for, for, not for persecution, but for self-defense and protection against those bad creeps out there who seek to come in and do us harm, just for, for harm's sake, for, for stupidity. Um, again, like in Sutherland Springs, if there had been armed people among that congregation... They probably would have taken that guy out. I would imagine so. Imagine outside the church if there was a sign that says, several of our members conceal carry. You think that guy would have went in there? So again, I'm not advocating violence, but the Lord said, if you don't have one, buy one. The Lord did. For crying out loud. Well, right, for persecution's sake, we are not to. And, and for the Lord, he, this, that was his destiny. And basically, you're right, the Lord saved Peter's life by putting that ear back on, otherwise it would have arrested him too. <laughs> um, comment? <laughs> yep, I'm there for you. Um, or for our houses, or wherever we are, if there's a bad guy, if we're in a bank, and we happen to be carrying and a, a robber comes in, um, I would expect those of us who are trained, who know how to use a gun safely and have gone to the range, who have practiced and know what they're doing, to use it. Why? For the protection of innocent life. That's the whole base of the law. There's something called the spirit of the law and the letter of the law. Okay, The spirit, the underlying spirit of the law is to save and preserve innocent life. That's what this is about. It's not about avoiding persecution. The Lord said, those of you who, who desire to live godly in Christ will suffer persecution. We don't shy away from that. So, and, and, and that's where we draw the line. If they come to persecute us, we don't fire back. We lay down our arms. We, we try to give them the good news. Exactly. 
Oh, yeah. I pray for the persecuted as often as I can. That their witness and testimony would bring about many salvations every day. And that those people would then turn around and reap a harvest, some 100, some 60, some 30 fold. You betcha. All, especially in North Korea, China, and the Islamic held areas, that the, um, the persecuted would be able to speak out. Where did we leave off? Yeah, this is an uh, interesting topic. I didn't want to go too far <laughs> into it. I knew this was going to be kind of controversial. Incidentally, just as a complete digression, that guy, um, Stephen Williford, who shot that, the gunman, who, who shot back and, and took out the gunman, was a former NRA gun instructor. And I would just like to point out that none of these mass shooters, none, have had any association with the NRA. So to come down on the NRA and gun rights because of these mass shootings, it's wrong. It's putting blame in the wrong place. Now, I'm not advocating or being a commercial for the NRA, but I just want to stop the lies. Let's tell the truth. Let's be honest. Be honest about this. Um, notes, 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 notes. So many churches have members who are trained and carry guns to church. Jesus qualified the verse in 38 by saying two swords among 12 was enough. The point is not violence, but protection and self-defense. Paul was persecuted mercilessly, but there was a time when he stood up for himself. Remember that? Remember when Paul stood up for himself in Acts 22, verse 24 says this, Acts 2, 24. The commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks and said that he should be examined under scourging. So they were about to beat Paul mercilessly and try to figure out what was going wrong. So that he might know why they shouted against him. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard that, he went and told the commander, saying, Hey, take care of what you do. This man is a Roman. Then the commander came and stood and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman? And he said, Yes. The commander answered, With a large sum I attained this citizenship. Paul said, But I was born a citizen. Then immediately those who were about to examine him withdrew. So there you go. There are times when it's okay to say, Hey, Wait a second here. What you're doing is not right. I'm not shying away from persecution, but I want you to know why first. You're not going to beat me without me giving my testimony. Then I willfully will yield to whatever you want to do. So there comes a time when it's okay to say, hey, you sure you know what you're doing? <laughs> because I could have you arrested. Actually, you bound me without any... Uh, accusation, anything. That alone was a criminal offense against a Roman citizen. They were in trouble. That's why they were worried and backed off. They said, hey, hey, stop what you're doing. He's a Roman. So, <laughs> isn't it great to see Paul play that ace? Like, oh, you got the king of spades? Spank! I got the ace. <laughs> Take that. <laughs> I just think those kind of little blurbs in the Bible just are fascinating. Anyway, I digress. Verse 39. Luke 22, verse 39. Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives, as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. Now the Lord repeats himself. This is the first time he said it, so let's pay attention here. Pray that you may not enter into temptation. What's a good antidote for temptation? Prayer. Verse 41, And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven and strengthening him. Isn't that interesting? The verse is not in the other Gospels, but it's here. So we'll talk about it later. Verse 44, And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he rose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping with sorrow. Then he said to them a second time, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. 
How many times does the Lord have to say something for us to get the message and for it to be true? Just once. So when he repeats himself, when God repeats himself, that's man's cue to say, okay, you're, I hear you pulling my ear. I get the message. Prayer is an antidote for temptation. When the devil seeks to give you a shot of temptation, the Lord wants to give you that antidote, but you have to accept it and kneel down and pray. Prayer is the antidote. Where are we? Verse 39 is what we just read. So leaving the Passover slash Last Supper slash First Communion, Jesus went to go pray. He took Pete, Jim, and Johnny a little closer with him and told them, you know, verse 40, hey, pray that you don't enter into temptation, boys. Peter needed to pray, but he fell asleep. And I could just do the same thing. Sorry but I'm just as weak and just as human as everybody else. The Lord says, hey, I need you to pray for an hour. Five minutes into it, I'll be like, I'm sorry, Lord. The prayer of Jesus reveals, what was the prayer? Father, if it is your will, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not, not your will, but mine be done. No, not my will, but thine be done. Many people get that confused and they pray, not thine, but my will be done. Never heard that before? I've heard it many times. The prayer is, Father, this needs to be settled right here, right now, once and for all. If there's any other name by which men can be saved, speak it now. If there's any other way men could be saved except the cross, say it now. Basically, it's speak now or forever hold your peace. If there's any other way of salvation, any other way than what I'm about to do, Lord, any other name, Buddha, Krishna, name it. Speak it now. Father said, no, no other way, son. What you're about to do breaks my heart. It breaks your heart. Humankind will never know the full depth of what we are both about to suffer on this cross. There's no other way, son. you got to do it. got to do it. Works. Lord, can they do works and be saved? Can they do works of the law and be saved? No. Can they say a prayer for forgiveness of their sins? If they sin, can they, can, they, can they ask somebody, what do I do to get forgiven? Well, repeat this prayer 50 times and, and, and this, will, this will forgive your sins. No, son, that won't work either. It's only your blood that forgives. That's it. That cleanses. Let me read it from my notes. I put them a little more eloquently, perhaps. The prayer of Jesus reveals that there is no other way of redemption from God to man and no other way of salvation from man to God than for the cross. It is the truth the world just doesn't want to hear. They would rather do something. They would rather participate in their salvation some way in order to be saved. The Bible and the cross and this. No. The one thing Jesus requires is a big triangle sign that says yield. It's the one thing we just don't want to do. We don't want to yield. Semicolon, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way to get to God, the Father. There is no other salvation, no other name by, by, by Jesus that will save us. No, that's it. If there was any other way, and I need to emphasize this, and hammer it down, and pound it home, and I'm sorry if I'm beating a horse over and over again, proverbially, um, but i got to make this clear. If you're in a denomination, whatever the denomination is, I don't care, that says Jesus and you must do this work. Baloney. Baloney. For the purpose of salvation. Now, once you're saved, you better believe it's on. You, you do do works. Not to be saved, but you do works because 
you are saved with a heart of gratitude to the Father. You know, there's a million other places I could be except here right now. I could be doing a bunch of other things right now. It's a beautiful day outside. I don't know if you can see this. It's like 70 degrees, clear skies, low humidity. We don't get many days like this in Texas, baby. So you better enjoy them. But I'm here in a home for assisted living, teaching the Word of God. Why? Because my salvation means the world to me. And I would not give it up for anything. And because my Jesus died to purchase me, I will sit here as long as he wants and preach his gospel. Even though there's other things I could be doing. In the flesh, I may rather be doing them. But in the spirit, I will yield to my Father all day long. I will skip meals for my Father. I will do whatever it takes. As long as he's leading and guiding and providing, my faith will be as reckless as he wants. Following that example. Am I perfect? Oh no, I've not arrived by any stretch of, or any of the means, you know? Anyway, there's no other salvation by which we must be saved. There is no other cleansing and forgiveness. No other way but his blood. And justification, there's no other way but his resurrection. And that's it. That's it. If there were any other way, emphatically, God would have answered God as God knelt and prayed to God. Did you catch all that? I can qualify it to make it more clear. If there were any other way, emphatically, the Father would have answered the Son as the Son knelt and prayed to the Father. God the Father and God the Son. So verse 43 is something very interesting. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven and strengthening him. In this, in this time of prayer, in this time of weakness, you have to understand the irony. This is the one who spoke the angels into existence. Chapter 1 of John says that everything was created by Christ and nothing that is created is, has not been created except it was created by Jesus. He is the creator of all, of everything. John chapter 1, okay, and, and Revelation is all created for him, for his glory. Okay, why were you created? For God's glory. So, if here God, the, the Son, the creator of all, is being strengthened by an angel, do you kind of see the irony in that? That just points out, again, emphatically, Jesus left all that in heaven, his godness. And depended 100% on the same Holy Spirit that He gives us, who is in constant communication with the Father as He is in us. He put Himself fully in our shoes to this degree that He needed strengthening to continue on. He couldn't even carry the cross but fell down and somebody else had to help Him carry it. He was fully human in this capacity of salvation for us and bore it all as a normal human being would be under the same physical stress, to the point he was so weak that it took an angel. This is God who required the strengthening of an angel. Is that phenomenal? That's huge. That is just massive. God needing the strengthening of an angel. I, wow. As he prayed for me, for you, in the Garden of Gethsemane. He prayed tenaciously. So much. I envision tenacity at, like this. Two football teams, when the ball is snapped, that instant when they, all the energy is released and you hear the skulls crack. The helmets go, <laughs> That energy, right there, that's tenacity. That's the, the energy that he was using when he was praying for us. That, that all out, Mm. Lord, if there's any other way, I'm going to do this. I'm going to take this cup. But if there's any other way, do it now. And he prayed with that so much energy, it drained him to the point where he needed that strengthening. That's what that's all about. Verse 47, 22, 47. That's where we left off, right? Verse yeah. 47. 
And while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude, and he who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When those around him saw what was going to happen, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. Now either Peter was left-handed or struck him from behind, which is a cowardly move. Verse 51, but Jesus answered and said, permit even this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, captains of the temple, and the elders who came to him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs when I was with you daily in the temple? You did not try to seize me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. I think this is, after I teach on this, this is where we're going to stop. Can you get a pen? Remember when, thank you, when Jesus told Peter, get behind me, Satan. Remember that? When Jesus was telling them, well, after he said, who do men say that I am? And that's when they all said, Peter said, oh, you're the Messiah of God. And he said, you know, you're right. Flesh and blood didn't really reveal this to my father. And then he went on to tell them how he must suffer. And Peter said, no, you can't do that. And that's when Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Remember that? For something Peter said that was motivated by Satan. Remember we read earlier that Judas, remember what happened? Um, Satan entered Judas and he went out and go and bargained with the, the leaders for Jesus, how he might deliver them, deliver him to them. So why didn't Jesus talk directly to Satan there too? But didn't. He spoke directly to Judas. I think this is miles and miles deep. Why didn't he speak directly to Peter? What's this all about? This is huge. This is huge. Jesus addressed the presence of Satan with Peter. Here Jesus speaks directly to Judas, not to Satan. This gentle rebuke is the final cry from Christ to Judas, the last chance he was giving him. And so he didn't address the devil. His heart broke for Judas, and he cried out to him, Judas, stop what you're doing. Are you really doing this? You don't have to. You've got this last opportunity. Turn around. But he didn't. Are you going to do this? So Jesus spoke directly to Judas. And I think that's when Judas's eyes were open and Satan was not there anymore. And so he clearly spoke uninterfered by the presence of darkness directly to Judas and gave his last plea. And Jesus will do that. He will carry you on his back all the way to the gates of hell. But that's when he says, I can't go any farther. You've got to make a decision. i got to put you down. You either come back with me or you continue on the way you're going to destruction. That's the plea and the cry Christ was giving him. He knew what he had done in that instance. Judas knew. I think all the conviction that you've ever felt from the Holy Spirit, the strongest conviction, I think Judas felt it like nothing before. He felt that Holy Spirit touch like, I just messed up big time. Huge. I think he felt that but then he doubted God's forgiveness. He felt the depth of the conviction 
and by the condemnation of Satan, but he doubted God's ability to forgive even this. And they went out and hung himself. So Peter uses a sword offensively, not defensively. That's the issue. We do not use our weapons offensively. We use them defensively. Nobody was coming in and attacking them. Peter just went out and swung like a madman. <laughs> Good thing he was a little drowsy because he kind of missed the guy's head. Just cut off his ear. Not sure if he had bad aim. Being a fisherman, he's probably in training. Didn't go to the range enough and practice with that sword. <laughs> the Lord says no. Jesus saves Peter's life by healing the man's ear. Now Jesus offers those who come to get him a chance to repent. In verse 52, knowing Judas was over, Jesus says, um, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? Okay, what are the rest of you doing? I could not begin to imagine looking into the eyes of Christ as he looked around at each one of them who were coming to take him. First Judas, and Judas just melted like butter on a hot summer day. He just felt it. And then just the look in Jesus' eyes. What are the rest of you doing here? Have you come out against a robber? A thief? With all these clubs and swords and torches in the middle of the night? This is scandalous. You know what you're doing is illegal? Which was. It's supposed to be done in the daytime. And the last phrase he uses, this is your hour and the power of darkness. What does he mean by that? Your hour and the power of darkness. And this is what we're going to close with. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, way back in the garden, this is foretold. God says, I will put enmity between you, talking to the devil, and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He will bruise your head, and you will bruise his heel. Now, the interesting thing is, where Jesus was crucified was on the hill of the skull. And as he stood there on the cross, crushing the head of the enemy, his heel got a little bruised in the process. I, I don't know why, but I always get the thought of a karate move, that Jesus just, with his, his leg, whoosh, just whacks Satan's head, with a roundhouse kick that just knocks him off his block. Or you can picture it like he's walking along and stomps, like in the movie um, The Passion of the Christ um, by what's his name? Mel Gibson. How he just crushes Satan's head, the snake, as he's walking out of Gethsemane. <laughs> and just crushes. You know, we walk the same path and we see the same snake kind of nervously wiggling. Jesus says, hey, don't worry. I've already walked this path and his head is crushed. He can't do any damage. Don't worry about it. He's just a nervous twitch. Don't sweat it. And that's where we leave him. I'm sorry, but uh, lest I drag this out too long like I did last time. We're going to go ahead and cut it there and continue on next week where we left off, which I completely forgot where it was. But we'll get there. <laughs> Hope you've enjoyed it. We'll finish up this chapter and probably the whole next one as well, chapter 23. Um, thanks for joining us. May the Lord bless and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. See you next week.